At the commencement of the Civil War, Parliament enjoyed a considerable advantage over the, the King's party. They had control of almost all the big cities, uh, the south, the east of England, this is the most prosperous part, and of course London itself, the centre of trading activity, of uh, the economic powerhouse of, uh, of the country, the biggest uh, city of course by far. And therefore, of course, this was a considerable advantage. It had, by the way, all of the seaports, and not an important question for an island, except uh, with one exception of Newcastle, controlled everything, including Bristol at this stage. But of course, London was the key. London supplied them with a colossal amount of money, of funds which they needed to raise an army and fund an army, of course. And above all, an in almost inexhaustible supply of soldiers. Uh, for example, the youth of London, the apprentices who played such a role in the revolutionary events of uh, December and January, now volunteered massively, 4,000, I think. 4,000 of them enlisted, enlisted in a single day. So this was a, a colossal strong point with which to, to commence hostilities. By contrast, uh, the royalists were not in such a good position, actually. Charles's main strength consisted of the north of the country, uh, the West Country, especially uh, Cornwall in particular, and Wales. Uh, but these were the more economically backward areas, of course, with strong feudal traditions. It's partly why uh, a lot of the soldiers fought, from these areas fought for Charles because they traditionally supported their uh, feudal superiors, the landlords, the wealthy aristocracy, who were based in these areas. The king was therefore short of money and short of men. He established his headquarters at York, uh, where he proceeded to try to attract supporters and funds, and above all, arms. At this stage in the war, one of the central uh, preoccupations of both sides was to, was to raid the local uh, arms uh, deposits in order to equip their armies. And in this respect, there's an interesting episode that took place in, in the Yorkshire city of Hull. It is a, a port. It was important as a port, but it was also important because it contained a large amount of arms, an arsenal of arms left over from the previous wars with Scotland. And Charles, who was based in York, thought it would be a simple matter if he if he'd only just turn up outside the gates of York and uh, asked to be let in, uh, he could get his whole get his hands on this colossal. Uh, Arsenal, which of course he desperately needed. Uh, big mistake, by the way. He turned up outside the gates, okay, with his armed <coughs> supporters. But uh, the, the the governor, Sir John Hoff Hotham, was a parliamentary supporter, refused to let him in, which didn't please him. Uh, the king argued and pointed out politely that he was, uh, in point of fact, the king of England, and therefore he couldn't rightfully be refused entry. But nevertheless. Sir John Hotham at this stage stuck to, his, it stuck to his guns. And therefore, choking with rage, Charles had to turn around, turn tail, and return empty-handed to York. But of course, despite the difficulties which the Royalists initially faced, they did have, however, one very important advantage. And that advantage was a clear superiority in cavalry. Now, this is not an accident if you think about it. It's also a class question, actually, because only wealthy people have horses, poor people don't have horses, and wealthy people learn how to ride, especially in those days, where the aristocracy spent most of its time hunting, shooting, and fishing, and therefore they, they, they could use horses quite effectively. In addition to which, they had another good example. They had, unlike uh, Parliament, which lacked ex experienced cavalry commanders, they had a very good uh, cavalry commander, experienced commander, in the person of Prince Rupert of the Rhine, who was actually Charles's uh, nephew, who turned up very early and volunteered to, uh, to help. Now, I think it'd be fair to say that if the parliament would have had uh, Prince Rupert on their side, instead of the Earl of Essex, the war would have been over, over very quickly. The Victorian historian, 
Uh, Richard Green writes the following, and I quote, Charles had but a handful of men and the dash of a few regiments of horse would, 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 have, ended, would have ended the war. But Essex shrank from a decisive stroke and trusted to reduce the king peacefully to submission by a show of force. And this actually was the mentality of the parliamentary leaders in the early stages of the war. They thought that just purely by virtue of having superiority of numbers and so on, they would uh, uh, force the king to submit without the, the painful necessity of fighting a war. Uh, this, of course, again, behind this idea, this military uh, stratagem, if you can call it that, there's also a political consideration, a very important political and class consideration. That is to say, in reality, the moderate uh, Presbyterians who controlled Parliament at this stage did not really want to, to inflict a crushing defeat on the king at all. What they were really striving for in their heart of hearts was a compromise. They wanted to do a deal with the king that they would uh, have the lion's share of political power, and in the meantime, they'd allow him to wear the crown and enjoy a few privileges and so on. They even adopted the uh, rather absurd uh, uh, position to, to, to cover their tracks that the king had been, in reality, had been kidnapped by wicked counsellors and that they were fighting against these evil counsellors, not against the king himself. In the meantime, of course, the kidnap, the so-called kidnapped monarch, was proceeding to, pre preparing to march against the capital. Now, the, uh, the, 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 the war began inconclusively. You're talking about a series of uh, inconclusive uh, skirmishes, hardly worth mentioning. They did establish, however, the superiority of the, royal, the, royalty, uh, the royalist cavalry and also its, the reputation of Prince, uh, Prince Rupert as quite a formidable cavalry uh, leader. The f two armies finally met finally came into contact with each other in the field of Edge Hill, which is near Banbury. And this is the scene of the first decisive action of the Civil War. Now, the Battle of Edge Hill was fought on the 23rd of October, 1642. I always remember that. It happens, it happens to be my birthday, but that's a secondary matter. The objectives of the battle were quite clear. Uh, Charles was intending to move to advance his, his forces towards London. Capture of London was always the decisive question. The Earl of Essex, on the other hand, was uh, commanded to prevent this from happening, and therefore this was, the, uh, this was the decisive moment. And at this decisive moment in this battle, Rupert again did show his superiority as a cavalry commander. He led a dashing charge of, uh, of horse, which is his speciality. And this furious onslaught, it must be, must be quite terrifying to see these huge horses uh, galloping towards you. It had the desi desired effect. It smashed through the parliamentary cavalry, threw them into confusion, and they fled in complete disorder, being pursued by Rupert's triumphant cavaliers, who galloped on ahead as if they were in a fox hunt instead of a battle. I think perhaps that was probably their mentality. They probably despised the parliamentarians. The fact that they fled... Uh, underlined this belief in their complete superiority. And they probably did think this was a bit of fun. It's like a fox hunt. What more pleasant activity on a, on a nice morning to gallop along murdering uh, roundheads. This is quite uh, a good idea. And they ended up in, in the desirable place, which of course was the parliamentary baggage train, which they proceeded to plunder. And uh, this was quite a, a, a typical behavior on the part of these cavalier gentlemen. And as they were busy occupied, as they occupied themselves, plundering the uh, rich proceeds of the baggage uh, train, they forgot all about the battle, which they left far behind them. Now, this was a complete disaster, which uh, robbed Charles of, of a victory that was surely within his grasp. If they, if they had behaved differently, if they had turned around and wheeled around and attacked the, attacked the parliamentary infantry, that would be the end of that, but they didn't. And therefore, the parliamentary infantry, which was superiority, which, which had superiority, if you like, 
in relation to the Cavaliers, were able quickly to regroup and to launch a counteroffensive, which they did. They pushed stubbornly forward, inch by inch, foot by foot, with these long pikes, uh, the uh, dreaded uh, weapon of the, of, of the infantry. They pushed back to such a point, they, they pushed the, the Cavaliers back to such a point, that at one stage, Charles, Charles and his sons were in, in danger of being uh, captured by the parliamentarians. And, and, and that would have been a decisive defeat for Charles. As it happened, Prince Rupert collected his wits and came back just in time to save Charles from complete defeat. But nevertheless, as night fell, the whole battle was in a state of confusion. And the next day, although the parliamentarians were reinforced, actually, with fresh forces, fresh reinforcements had come up, they could have still won the battle for reasons best known to himself. The Earl of Essex instructed, gave the order to abandon the field of battle to the enemy. And he retired, he retreated to the safety of, uh, of Warwick Castle on the, on the pretext of allowing his soldiers to rest and recuperate. Now this, of course, allowed Charles, despite the fact that he was in, uh, not in a good position, to claim victory, to claim victory. And what this, uh, this uh, cowardly conduct of uh, Essex, what it achieved, is that it, uh, it encouraged the royalists, encouraged Charles, to pursue, pursue his objective, to advance on London, which is now defenseless. The Essex army was uh, cooped up in, in, in Warwick. He moved, subsequently moved to London, it's true. But there was nothing between Charles and Rupert and, uh, and the capital, and therefore they proceeded to advance, taking one city after another, one point after another. They advanced towards London. They, they seized the town of Reading, an important point on the, on the road to London, mainly because of the cowardice of its uh, defending forces, so it, so it appears. But one can imagine the state of panic in the streets of London. Co confused reports were reaching London long before this, that the parliamentary forces were defeated, and that the uh, cavaliers were at the gates, which they, in effect they were. They, they reached the, the point of... Uh, they reached uh, by, uh, by mid-December. They were on the outskirts of London in a place called uh, Brentford, which uh, people, of course, who live here, like myself, you know Brentford. It's now part of London. It wasn't at that stage, but anyway. The, the Royalists uh, took this place by surprise, and after a bloody battle, they seized Brentford, and they, snack, they sacked it. Not a very pleasant thing to happen. And therefore, therefore this caused, you can imagine, uh, a state of absolute panic on the streets of London. But this panic soon turned into, the alarm soon turned into anger and fury and a, a determination to resist. A large amount of men and boys volunteered for the army. Again, the apprentices played a key role in this. And at a place called Turnham Green, which you've probably never heard of, it, you find it on the tube map of London, in the west, and near Chiswick, actually, but tubes don't, don't usually stop there, in my experience, but it's there anyway. Turning Green was a, a turning point in the war, because at this point, the triumphant army of Rupert and, uh, and Charles were halted at the sight of a, of, of a huge army of some 24,000 men. That was a huge force. Well, militant people, but willing to fight, men willing to fight and die to defend their city, and therefore, uh, the, the, the road was blocked. The citizens of London were supporting the army actively. They were turning up, giving up food, digging trenches, and so the women were involved, and so on. The whole, the, the whole capital, in other words, was on a war footing, and this was clear to the royalist commander. So in spite of Charles's pleas, uh, he wanted them to advance, to give battle, and so on. He was determined to give battle, and so on, but uh, no chance. They, they, they understood that this was... Too, uh, too much for them to bite, uh, too, too, too much for them to digest, and therefore they, they turned around. And Charles, again, choking his uh, frustration and anger, was forced to, his bitter disappointment, he was forced to retreat to Oxford, where he remained. He remained for the rest of the war. Now, many battles were fought, fought subsequent after Edgehill, of course. The war continued for some years. But there is one 
one one battle in particular which I must mention it, it's not everyone knows about the Battle of Edge Edge Hill and uh, Naseby and so on and so forth, Marsden Moor and so on. But very few people know what happened in Bradford in Yorkshire. Now Yorkshire was ought to have been a strong point for the Royalists. Charles probably made a mistake when he marched south to Nottingham to declare the. the the start of the Civil War, and many of his generals were opposed to that, and they were quite right. He assumed that Yorkshire would be safe. It was a, a strong point, but because of the support of the nobility up north. Yeah, but that was a big mistake. Now, the man that he left in charge basically was a loyal supporter. He was also an able commander also. also. Uh, the Earl of Newcastle was left in charge, and he felt strong enough to proceed south to, to, to Yorkshire. He failed to get, uh, as Charles had failed to get into hell, he also f failed to, to get control of that city. But then he proceeded south to attack the ma manufacturing towns of the West Riding. Now, I should explain that this area, the West Riding of Yorkshire, was a center of, uh, yet another center of the uh, clothing industry. And of course, the, the inhabitants there were mainly, uh, you could say, small producers. They were men who owned their own looms and a, a small plot of land, a few chickens, and so on and so forth. Yeah, but in, in, in reality, they were semi proletarians, in effect, because they depended heavily on the big boys, the big merchants, the big wool merchants, particularly in Leeds who controlled the whole industry. They, de they depended on these merchants for supplies and so on and so forth, and trade, etc. And of course, in the process, they were terribly exploited. So here again, you have a class division, which alone can explain the division, the political divisions and the re religious divisions in Yorkshire between the strongly Protestant Puritan areas of the West Riding, and of course, the rich merchants of Leeds. Although even in Leeds, by the way, the majority of the population were were pro-parliamentary. They were pro they were, were Puritans, and therefore, when the, when the Earl of uh, Newcastle and his powerful army entered Yorkshire from the north, he first of all succeeded. He he managed to take uh, Leeds, although the population was opposed to the, to the king. He succeeded because of the betrayal of the uh, authorities the rich guys who sold out. This happened repeatedly. And then he turned his attention to the West Riding, to, to Bradford in particular, which it apparently it didn't stand a chance. People in Bradford were saying, look, we can't uh, resist the king's forces. We'll be cut to pieces and so on. But the, it turns out that the uh, religious radicals in Bradford, there were quite a few of them, strong Puritans, said, no, we're not having this. We're going to fight. And even if we're going to fight to the death, no matter what it costs. So they began to arm themselves. They didn't have a lot of forces. They, according to what I've read, they've got about, they had about 40 men, that's all. 40 men with muskets, 30 with uh, fouling, birding, and smaller pieces of small, small caliber guns. And twice that number of club men, men armed with clubs and scythes and uh, hatchets and so on and so forth. They then proceeded to, uh, having decided to resist, they, they, they turned out to, uh, to other villages and towns in the region, appealing for support, which they got, particularly from the men of uh, Halifax, when they appealed to, for support to their neighbors. So on Sunday morning, the 18th of December, 1642, the Royalist forces uh, approached the town. And here's a quote from, uh, from uh, one of the uh, people in Bradford. We had borrowed a commander for, uh, of Halifax. Uh, they, so they found one guy that was, uh, had military training. We had borrowed a commander of, of Halifax, and he stationed the men in several parts of the town, and 10 or 12 of our best marksmen, snipers that is, on the steeple and in, and in the church. The royalists who expected a surrender rather than resistance, was something daunted, was somewhat put off. Yeah, 
But when fired on from the church, they turned up outside Bradford expecting an instant success, and they were shocked. They were they received a hail of bullets from the from the church tower, which uh, surprised them, shall we say. Then at noon, of course, the reinforcements turned up. The men from uh, from uh, from Bingley and Halifax and other areas, club men. Some of the men, I've got the quotes here, some of the men of, 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 of Halifax had muskets, but mo most of them were armed only with clubs and scythes uh, laid, laid in poles. But with these primitive weapons, they staged a ferocious attack on the Royalists and drove them back. It's, it, it seems but the, that the Royalist troops weren't too uh, keen on fighting, actually. Because it is said, you know, although the royalist officers ma manifested great courage, their men he held back, and so attack and so attacks were concentrated on the officers. Is one incident which is quoted here. This poor chap had, had, had a very rough time. A stout, gallant officer commanding a company of foot got ahead got ahead of his reluctant soldiers and was separated from them. Two of the townsmen met and struck him down. He cried for quarter. That means to say, uh, you cry for quarter when you were asking for mercy. He cried for quarter, and they, poor men, not knowing the meaning of it, said, "I." They would, they would quarter him, and they cut him into four pieces. Very unfortunate end of this chap. And thus, the terror of the Lord and of us falling upon them. This is the end. The other side, the royalists. Sending, sending their foot and artillery foremost, away they went, using their feet better than they'd used their hands. And about 50 of our clubs and muskets after them. 50 men with clubs and muskets chasing after a whole army. Uh, which, which courage in ours, the, the most, most of, did most of all astonish the enemy, who say, no 50 men in the world, except they were mad or drunk, would have, pursued, would have pursued a thousand. Now that's an indication. The reason I'm quoting this is it illustrates the revolutionary fervor, the spirit that moved the mass of ordinary people, ordinary, the men with no swords in this, uh, in this civil war. Yes, that they were successful and they were subsequently led by uh, Sir Thomas Fairfax, big landowner who came over to the side of the revolution. Of course, that's just that's just an important factor. And it wasn't the usual thing, but it did occur in some instances. Uh, they, they were successful. They retook Leeds. They took Leeds and Wakefield from the Royalists. So Yorkshire then was, of course, uh, sharply turned toward, in the direction of Parliament. That was a big success. Yeah, but you see, because of the lack of leadership, this success, these successes were wasted. Elsewhere, things were not going too well. Uh, in, in the in the uh, West Country, the Royalists staged an uprising based on the Cornish people. Actually, Cornwall at that stage, the Cornish people were a, diff were a different people to the English. They were they spoke a different. They were Celts. Spoke a different language, Cornish, which is uh, similar to the Welsh language. But they were ferociously uh, loyal and attached to their feudal lords. They led them into battle, who led them into battle. And these barefoot soldiers, if you like, showed extraordinary courage in fighting, and they succeeded in in in, in the civil push, pushing these parliamentary parliamentary forces back in 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 in, in Somerset and Devon. But far worse than this was the terrible news of the fall of Bristol. Now, Bristol after London was the most important seaport in Britain, and it was solidly Puritan, solidly pro-Parliament, pro pro with very good defensive, defensive walls, the same as Hull and so on and so forth. And yet, in spite of the fact, even a, a relatively, uh, well, I suppose it was a strong royalist army, which laid siege to the city on the 26th of July, despite its formidable defenses, the governor surrendered handed the city over to Prince Rupert. This was a body blow. This was a body blow to Parliament. Here's the, the most important port in, in, in the country after London. It's just fallen into enemy hands, like, like a rotten apple falling into somebody's, somebody's lap. Richard Green, the historian, writes the following. 
The news of the loss of Bristol fell on Parliament like a sentence of death. The Lords debated nothing but proposals of peace. London itself was divided. Parliament was constantly fighting with one arm behind its back. This led to one setback after another. And as a result of this, you get the formation of what you might call the Peace Party, the Surrender Party, more correctly, led by the Earl of Bedford and Denzel Hollis. Denzel Hollis, who had been one of the prominent leaders of the parliamentary opposition in the past. And these people were, were determined to sabotage the war effort, to reach an agreement with the king and disorganize the parliamentary forces. In November 1642, the Essex train bands, that's the militia, came to London offering their services to fight, but they were sent back again because the Lord General had no use for them, it was said. And this was repeated continually, provoking an enormous discontent, tremendous discontent on the part of the, of the radicals. In London, there was such a, a feeling of despair that it was expressed in, in peace demonstrations, some of them dispersed by force, probably stirred up, undoubtedly stirred up by the so-called peace party of Bedford and, uh, and Hollands. This was an extremely dangerous moment extremely different. It looked at this moment in time as if the royalists might succeed, that the king might uh, come back. But precisely at this moment of extreme danger, important changes took place, important development took place that changed the entire face of the war. 